So let me go back to the slides, but some of the important things there was that you see again that black men were being shown as unable to participate in a democracy. And D.W. Griffith said at the beginning of that clip that it was a historical facsimile of something that happened. But keep in mind, this film is made 50 years after the Civil War. So most of the people who fought are dead. There's nobody, and black people don't have enough equity in the entertainment industry then or now, as we know, to stop this from happening. And because the president co-signs it, right, at the time this is shown, which is um, Woodrow Wilson, it makes it seem like it is historical. Okay, so when we look at some of the issues that black people have had as a result during the vote and trying to have access to voting, it's very important to understand that there's a lot of work being done to stop us from having equal, you know, from having our constitutional rights be able to be um, realized, especially even after the 19th Amendment where women are able to vote. So there's a lot of um, suppression of the vote. Um, this is going to look different. So in some states you have literacy tests, like in New York State, you'd have to read a statement in English, which doesn't specifically target black people, right? But rather people who are immigrants who have accents. So when you look at even, you know, people who don't teach their children their home language, that's the part of this is, you know, this is a big part of why. Um, this is an example of a literacy test for the state of Louisiana, the state of Alabama, you could also look up, which I highly recommend. It's usually very civics based. And the questions, this one specifically for Louisiana does not have an answer key. So I'll just, you know, kind of scroll through the pages, but the point is, is that these went through 1965. So my mom was 10 years old when this was finally made illegal, that you can't test people like this. Again, a lot of these tests don't have answer keys. It's really just given to people who they don't want to vote. Overwhelmingly, these are black people, especially in the Southern states. But like I said, they do exist in the North and in the West. It just looks very different. So um, yeah, I usually give this test to students. Most people don't finish it. But even if you get one wrong, the whole test is a wash. So you wouldn't be able to vote. And you all know, I'm sure, especially after this last election, maybe from the one previous, there's always a lot of barriers placed on the people who they don't want to vote. So even though it's not a test like this today, it's still very much a way to suppress people, make it difficult for them to vote and make it difficult for them to realize their constitutional rights. So that's all I wanted to say. Awesome, thank you, Professor, that was amazing. And you know, just, um, I just got a message that some of the people weren't able to uh, log in until maybe a few minutes into your, a few seconds into your presentation. So we're gonna just reintroduce -re ourselves one more time. Um, real fast, I would like to welcome all of our new uh, viewers who just logged in with us uh, to our first kickoff Black History Month celebration event at Grossmont College. On behalf of the Black History Month Planning Committee, Department, the Cross-Cultural uh, Department, and the History Department of Grossmont College, we would like to thoroughly welcome you uh, to our event. My name is Dr. Jason Allen. I'm a counselor and professor here at Grossmont College, and I'll let my colleagues, starting with the ladies, introduce themselves or reintroduce themselves. As <laughs> <well>. <laughs> 
Hello, everyone. Dr. Ticey Hosley. I'm an associate professor and counselor and also articulation officer at Queen Macca College. I also teach in the cross-cultural studies department, CCS 115, um, uh, cross-cultural competency course. I'm glad to be here. Hi, I'm Natalie Harpin. I teach a cross-cultural studies. I'm the Black Studies professor. So I do our Black history courses here at Grossmont and also dual enrollment at Helix High School. I'm Julio Soto, sociology professor at Grossmont College and at times also cross-cultural studies professor for the cross-cultural competence program. Very happy to be here. Huge, huge thank you to our professors for being here. As you guys know, this is the first week of school. Their time is precious. Everyone's running around with their hair on fire. So it's super huge that we can get these all-stars on this cast today to join us for our panel. So to the purpose, the purpose of today's panel, we're going to be examining the uh, US presidential election and the black vote of 2020. We're also gonna look at the significance of America selecting or electing its first female black vice president and kind of what it took to get there. You just heard uh, Professor uh, Harpin. Is it Pat Harpin or Pass? Am I, when is the married? <laughs> yes, okay, so legally it's Harpin. Harpin. <laughs> yes. Okay, just making sure I'm, I'm giving you your, your right accolades there. So. <laughs> Professor Harpin just gave us an amazing uh, re recap or overview of historically what some of the voter issues look like or voter suppression issues look like for our country. So that'll segue us right into our first bullet point or discussion topic uh, that we're gonna look at. So we had the historical standpoint of what voter suppression in this country might look like. Uh, professors, how would that look like or how does that compare or contrast to today's version of voter suppression or what voter suppression issues may still exist in 2020, 2021 in our world? You know, I think it's interesting um, that um, while things have changed, a lot has remained the same in terms of voter suppression. So we all witnessed this past election um, voter suppression play out in so many ways um, from uh, attempts at changing voter ID laws, right, which, which come up every election. Um, we even had uh, slowing down of the U.S. Postal Service to try to prevent um, folks that have mailed in ballots from being counted. And we know that this, with this particular election, we had a record number of individuals, particularly black individuals that voted by mail and voted early. So there was an attempt to slow that down, to stop that from happening. Um, we've had voter rolls purged. Um, certainly this happened in Georgia, we're gonna talk about, I'm sure Stacey Abrams at some point, um, this happened in Georgia for sure. Um, and just a number of consistent, it's, it's really familiar because it is repeated with every election. Um, this attempt never stops uh, to try to minimize and limit the number of black folks and folk, folks of color that are able to participate. Awesome. Thank you. I'll, I'll add, um, borrowing from uh, one of the co-hosts of the uh, podcast, uh, which hashtag housing segregation to everything, right? Um, when we understand how this has been a historical and structural pattern to create uh, a certain level of disenfranchisement towards Black people and other communities of color, especially low-income communities, uh, we understand that this has been kind of part of an American tradition, right? Even before uh, this was a nation. There's been very systematic ways to disenfranchise and not even have uh, Black people have a say in the electoral process. And it continues today, right? Uh, and uh, I think that it's important to understand how, uh, based on a bola de descarados, sinvergüenzas, or people with like no morals, right, uh, in politics. Uh, we ended up with a very in-your-face um, um, presentation of uh, folks who are determined to keep uh, all members of our society from casting their ballot, right, and having a say in this one of the many ways that we can get involved in bringing about um, 
the social change in our society, right? So I think it's important for us not to fall trapped to this idea that this is something of the past. Uh, I think that it's important that we understand this as part of our um, uh, roots in colonialism, right? How it continues to manifest itself in such a way that it's now veiled through new policies that end up being presented as colorblind, but in reality, there's an enormous amount of purposeful disenfranchisement of communities of colors, black voters in particular, brown voters in particular as well. But we can see also the power of resistance. So I'm glad that uh, Dr. Hosni presented the, the case of um, uh, the resistance in Georgia that I hope we have an opportunity to talk about as well. Awesome. Uh Professor uh, Harpin, did you have anything that you want to add uh, to this one? No pressure. Uh, I know, right? No pressure. Uh, <laughs> I guess, I mean, you know, so far I, was, I completely agree with, you know, what both um, Julio and Ticey were saying. But I think for me also, it's very important that people understand that even within the, the POC umbrella, right, people of color, is that there is a lot of anti-Black disenfranchisement that happens on a daily basis that makes it possible for these things to happen institutionally when it comes to voting. So that's the only thing I wanted to add. Awesome, love that, and love that. Super powerful points. And before we transition to our next, uh, our next segue, you know, I just wanted to remind our viewers, first, thank you guys for coming. Uh, super huge that you guys are here. We know you guys are busy. This is the first week for you as well. Um, we wanna hear from you as well. There may not be time to directly engage you during the panel presentation and open dialogue. However, uh, if you look in the comment section on the YouTube live stream, uh, you have the ability to comment. So if you have any questions for myself or our amazing panelists, uh, please, we will record your questions and get them to them later uh, so that you guys can uh, receive an email with an answer or you know, uh, a response to your question. Also, uh, this is being brought to you by the Grossmont College live stream YouTube website. Please feel free to subscribe to that channel, smash the like button. Uh, we, we try to provide amazing content, cultural content for this, uh, for you guys each month of the academic year, whether it's the Latino Alliance, whether it's His Hispanic Heritage Month, Black History Month, Pacific Islander, and so many other amazing months that we try to celebrate and make our students our diverse student body feels special. So please subscribe to the channel. We're gonna to try to keep this amazing content coming to you guys. All right, so we've alluded to the Georgia Senate runoff. Do we wanna just go there right now? Is that a, I mean, that's a heavy topic. Are you guys warmed up? I don't want anybody to throw out a shoulder or arm. Are we ready? Listen, you know what? Let's just go ahead and dive into that. So we've had a few of our panelists already mention the Georgia Senate runoff and how huge that was what kind of mon monumental forces it took for that to happen. So we'll just, uh, Stacey Abrams and some of the other coalition of leaders uh, were already mentioned, but let's dive into that a little bit deeper. What did that take or what, what, what does that look like? Give us some background to that guys. Well, I'll jump in. I mean, um, one thing that it took and that um, I continue to be proud of is just the resiliency of the Black voter and uh, folks of color in general who have, um, you know, we continue to have uh, these efforts to keep us out of this process, right? And to quiet and silence our voices. Um, and the result is that we come back stronger. Um, so that resiliency is just, um, it's amazing. So Stacey Abrams, um, who I just, uh, I can't say enough about what she has done um, and with the influence that she had in this election. Uh, many of you will know that she ran for governor in uh, Georgia in 2018. She lost by about 50,000, 55,000 votes. And what is surely a, a questionable situation there, but we we won't we don't have to get into that. But what she did with it, instead of just taking that loss, um, uh, deciding to put her efforts into helping, um, in this case, it was Joe Biden and the Democrats 
win in 2020, which she did was simply amazing. Um, the motivation, she, she was able to, to motivate and get so many voters to register. And before I, before I uh, let somebody else speak, because I can just go on and on, um, it, you know, elections have consequences, right? One of the things, um, and we know that voting, once someone votes, they tend to vote, vote habitually, right? They make a habit of voting. So we're talking about a long-term impact of individuals that she has brought into this process, right? That will continue to vote in elections to come. And we, you know, we can get into what, you know, what that means and what those consequences are, but just that of itself that she's brought all these people in um, uh, and they will continue to vote is huge. I can't say enough about her, but I'll stop to let someone, <laughs> to someone else chime in. Um, I guess that was great. I'll add to that. I saw something immediately after the election and it was saying that they declared that the, that the Southern states weren't red, that they were suppressed. And I think that this is a great starting for, you know, the organization or other organizations to also try to do that same work to, you know, find out where people's votes are being suppressed, how they are to make it more equitable in those states. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and it's very important, right, that we center not just Black voters, but Black mujeres, right, Black women voters, right, because historically change has been placed in the shoulders of Black women, right, and all of us will do right to uh, listen, reflect, analyze the work that Black women continue to do. That's why I'm Quite honored that you invited me here uh, as a cis male um, in this space, uh, brown ally. Uh, I cannot tell you how much I continue to learn uh, and unlearn, you know, because we got to understand that our nation rests in a foundation of patriarchy and misogyny. Uh, so it will do us right to reflect about that, those of us who are male, particularly cisgender male, right? And, uh, but also because historically we got numerous examples that quite frankly, we should continue to ask ourselves, how is it that black people continue to show up? How is it? Faculty members, if you're here, you should be amazed that black students are still showing up at your classes and you should do everything in your power to support them. So particularly sending good love um, to all of our communities of color, but to our black community uh, in this first event, really honored to be here. But uh, it is quite important that we go back to what Professor uh, Harpin presented, uh, anti-blackness, right? Anti-blackness has been a necessary uh, idea, right? We're not just talking about race as an idea in racism, right? We're talking about a particular kind of racism in anti-Blackness, right? In this film, Birth of a Nation, this mythology of Black criminality ends up being central to a lot of the social policies that end up being part of the way policies were set in place for border suppressions and all kinds of inhumane practices towards our Black community, right? So we gotta be students of history, all of us. We have to be students of history. We have to understand not only the oppressive component of the structures of our society, white supremacist oppressive components that are resting in a foundation of patriarchal and racial capitalism, right? So we gotta really break apart all of these structures. You know? So I think that it's central for us to consider how the collective work done by Stacey Abrams and others is an example of how we now can look at playbooks that are being done at the grassroots levels by particularly communities of color and again, highlighting black women. But quite frankly, it's a tradition, right? Uh, it'll serve us well for us to take a look at the work of uh, the uh, Kumbahi River Collective, for example, in the 70s that set in place some of the conversations that we're having. And even before that, of course, we need to talk a little bit about the folks that have uh, influenced these conversations um, sojourner through 
Uh, we need to look at Ida B. Wells uh, in my discipline of sociology is so central for us to understand the power of black mujeres uh, pushing these conversations and quite frankly, um, challenging our nation to live by its uh, professed ideals, right? And um, I want to add to that. That was great. I want to add to that, that, um, you know, sometimes people think, you know, oh, well, like Stacey Abrams, right? But all of you have that within you. So definitely, like, don't think that you can't have impact at the local level. There are a lot of, like, um, you know, Dr. Soto was just saying, there, there's so many grassroots organizations here in San Diego that you all can be a part of, that you can share on your social media for yourselves or other people who may need those resources. And hopefully it will inspire each of you to at least do something, right? Even if nobody, even if it seems unattainable, like it's a big idea, it's the work of a lot of people individually working together. So I would definitely encourage you all to, you know, take Stacey Abrams as an inspiration, but also see that within yourself and then be a part of the larger, um, you know, communities here in your local area. Yeah. Stacey, did you, you have something there? Yeah, I, 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 ha I have so many thoughts going through my... <laughs> uh, oh man, so many thoughts going through my head. Sorry if I, I saw that internet unstable thing. So if I went out for a second there. Um, but I think when when Biden won uh, Georgia uh, in the election, people thought there's no way um, these runoffs, there's no way both seats are going to the Democrats. It's not going to happen. Um, and it did. Um, the Democrat, Democrats pulled off um, both winning both of those seats. And so I think, so, you know, Georgia becomes this now battleground um, where some votes have been suppressed before, right? We know that if we, we put in that effort, if we are resilient, if we get a bunch of people involved in this process, that we can change the outcome of elections. Um, so it's, it's the significance of that. Uh, and not just, you know, we mentioned Stacey a Abrams, but certainly there were um, other Black women who were involved. Um, Latosha Brown, Black Voters Matter, you know, she's doing work um, in Florida, in Tennessee, in Georgia, Louisiana, and in all these states um, to, to pull more people into the process. And again, I will go back to it at some point, what we talk about the, the long-term implications of, of, you know, what the outcome means, because I do hear people saying, oh, well, it, you know, I don't vote because it doesn't matter. It doesn't impact me. Um, and not only does it impact you locally, but it can impact your life, your children's life and so forth. Um, there can be really long, long-term effects. So voting absolutely matters. And I'll stop talking for a minute so we could get... <laughs> No, no, no. All, all great stuff. And, you know, it just made me want to, it just makes me sit back and think. And I hope, you know, I can, I can, you know, and I can explain the emotion that's going through me right now to our audience members, our students. You know, I'm a professional. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a counselor. These are my colleagues. Yet, when I listen to them speak, you guys, I, you know, there's a sense of excitement inside of me and a sense of awe, you know, I always want to be woke. I always want to be knowledgeable. And so I really want to encourage our audience members, our students to hang around to the end. We're not going to go on forever, but we're going to leave you guys with a book list and a podcast list of books and literature that you guys can explore and read on your own so that when you speak, <laughs> you can pull from such a deep well of knowledge and information that you've learned and not just from TikTok or Instagram, but from actual authors who have been doing this type of work, studying this type of work, dedicating this, their lives to this type of work, like the people who you see on your screen right now. So it just really, really makes me very excited to, to hear the differing perspectives from our cross-cultural, our history, and our um, sociology department here. It, it, it's definitely a treat. So we've hit on the power of the Black vote and Black women in particular
when we look at these demographic numbers of the black of the Turner of the voter turnout, you know, massive numbers, 75 million on one side, 80 million on the other side, on the Democratic side, you know, black women in many, many areas were leading the charge for black America and just America in general as well. My question to the panel. Was there a sense of pride or what, you know what, let me not put any in, into your brain. What reaction when you saw the demographic number break down and you know, the, the massive numbers of black women who were using their power and their voice, regardless of how the vote turned out, the point is that they showed up and wielded their power. Was there a sense of pride or what, how, do you feel, how did you guys feel when you saw those numbers? Um, I think for myself, I felt, so happy, right? I mean, and part, you know, being a black Westerner, I was very, very happy with what happened in general. I wasn't surprised by the numbers because we tend to think about other people when we are making our voting decisions. And that's something we as black women have historically done, even if it doesn't, even if the person doesn't directly benefit us. So I was happy about it, but then I also sort of felt like, you know, wow, as impactful as we are and as much as we as a demograph have shown that we want to work across the lines and, you know, have the interests of other people, I was really wishing that other people would invest that same work into us. Yeah, it's, it's really hard for me to, um, <laughs> probably without getting emotional to, to, to talk about um, what that meant. You know, one thing um, I want to say is that that resiliency, that strength, that power that we show is in spite of so much trauma. And it's in spite of so much continued trauma um, and a weight that we as Black women carry with us daily. It's on our shoulders. Um, and you know, 2020, there was, there was, there was so much, <laughs> there was more trauma. And so not only do we continue to lead, but we continue to, to lead despite all of the trauma. Um, and people may think because we keep doing it, that it's an easy thing to do. Um, and I will tell you firsthand that it is not as I try to talk to you without breaking down because I feel the weight of all of the trauma. But I know that there are children, there are students, there are generations that are counting on us to keep fighting this fight that we've been in for so long. Um, so for me, Kamala being the first black uh, woman, the first South Asian woman. Um, she, she also attended a historically black college, which I'm so proud of. She's part of um, a black sorority. Um, she was the first, but we know that she won't be the last. Um, and it gives me so much hope and it gives me um, strength to continue um, because some days it feels like I'm fighting so hard and um, it's, a, it's a heavy weight but um, pride doesn't quite capture it. It, is, it, um, it was a, a significant moment for sure. Thank you both uh, Professor Hartman and Dr. Hosley. I always, I always feel, uh, uh, Dr. Hosley, I always feel your emotions. Every single time we cross paths and we share our space like this, I feel that for you is, this is not an academic exercise. This is something that is a daily lived experience, so it's with additional respect that I that I share this space with you. Okay, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, you know, I think that it's important to contextualize and without centering whiteness because it's not about white people today, right? Let me just tell you, I got some choice wars at the end because we gotta talk about white supremacy, gotta talk about white allyship, and gotta talk about white complicity. So bear with me, my beautiful white people. If you're there, bear with me. We gotta still do some work, okay? But I gotta tell you, you know, it's been particularly in the um, work and struggles of uh, black voters that 
uh, an election like um, the two elections of uh, Barack Obama were possible in the first place. And it's important to understand that 2016 was an anti-blackness backlash, you know? And uh, what does it mean, right, when um, we have uh, people of color in positions of power, but then the structural uh, inequities that continue to place people of color, particularly black men in economic disenfranchisement, uh, disenfranchisement continue to exist, right? So it is important for us uh, at this moment that we celebrate um, the end of this, and I'll say this unapologetically, white supremacist in the White House, right? The end of his term, it is important to uh, feel a sense of relief over that. But in reality, we got to talk about how that's still something within the systems and structures of our society, right? Because we continue to see uh, Black women in the lower economic status. It's not just that we have, uh, for every $1 earned by white men, we have 78, 79 cents by white women, and then it drops to 64 cents for a black woman, and even more so when you start looking at other layers that intersect to continue to reproduce inequities, right? So uh, to me, it's a moment of important historical celebration. Um, I think that uh, we have to uh, uh, account for it, and it's, it's a sense of relief, especially with the poetry that to me, it just grounds us into the possibility and, you know, to borrow from James Baldwin, hope is invented every day. So I'll take it today, you know, I'll take that today, but let's make sure that we keep this administration, including our first black vice president accountable to the work that still needs to be done. Let's make sure that we don't fall asleep. Absolutely love that. Your professors are, are amazing. And speaking of professors, I wanted to take a quick time to shout out all of our professors who brought their class or encouraged your class to attend today. We really love you. We appreciate you. I saw Steve Davis, chair of the Grossmont, co-chair of the Grossmont Math Department. I saw uh, Michael Golden from Biology, and I know there's a few other in here. Uh, please forgive me if I overlooked you, but we do really appreciate you. And you know, Professor Soto is definitely talking about uh, the need and the presence of a rainbow coalition to fight deep rooted forces that have been in place since the construction of this country. And you know, the professors at Grossmont, the ones who I just listed, and so many others, they answered the call. They joined that rainbow coalition uh, to make sure that we're fighting these forces so that as uh, Julio said, you know, we can move to a place where everyone, there's more equity, there's more equal pay, there's less you know, social injustice, and it takes your professors, um, it takes people like your professors who believe in their students, who invest in their students to go out and be the next generation of leaders. So definitely take your your, your instructors an apple. Well, you know what, it's COVID, so you can't do that. You can't take yeah. an apple right now, but <laughs> send them a digital apple and make sure you thank them. Okay, so. Oh, can I say something real quick? Of course, of course. One of the things that um, I had remembered just now was that when, um, Dr. Soto was talking about the backlash, right? That I was thinking about, you know, Cory Booker, who I believe is now representative for St. Louis and how, you know, you have these new people who, you know, have done community work, who started their political careers, who are, you know, trying to get into it. And then they had to deal with the insurrection and the, the threat that they might lose their lives. So I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that, um, how scary, of course, that was for everybody and how, especially how scary it was for the people who were the targets of that specifically. And that, that backlash again to, you know, people advancing who were never meant to advance, historically speaking. You know, and I love that. I love the fact that you're bringing up the backlash and the capital events of January 6th. And, you know, that's another reason why I, I made sure to ask our professors, what are they reading? Who are they reading? Who do they suggest we should be reading? Because, you know, I really think a huge portion of those events have a lot to do with the way that we construct our or go about our daily lives in society now. You know, everyone's talking in these vacuums of social media. You know, we, we all follow who we follow on TikTok or Instagram without giving little uh, respects to 
people who may have differing opinions or listening to sources that may differ from our own. The whole purpose of being in co college is to learn how to critically think, to examine multiple sources of, of, of information. Even if you believe something, you know, you should still know what the, con the, the, the converse or the contra is to that point that you believe in. You got to know what the other side of the argument is. But in today's world, you know, there's a, a show on Netflix called The Social Dilemma where it shows just how we get so entrenched in our own beliefs to where we think it's okay that we have to go storm a capital and take our, our country back because you keep hearing these talking heads say that, say that, say that. And so the point of providing the book list at the end is so that you can you guys can have a, a plethora of literature literature and other source materials so that you don't ever allow your brain just to become so narrowly focused to where you cannot consider other sides of any kind of argument or or anything of that so we were talking about the power of the vote the power of the black vote black women voters who turned out so let's get right into uh the next subject what is the significance to you, to the world, to the country, what, what is the significance of us electing our first female black vice president? Is that significant, you guys? <laughs> well, for sure, I think it's very significant. Um, I think it also is a great testament to the notion that, you know, if you go to an HBCU, that somehow you're not as qualified as, you know, people who go to PWIs, which is predominantly white institutions, um, and also really highlights the you know, unity that people find in the Black Greek organizations, right, the Divine Nine. Um, I think just like Dr. Soto said, you know, we have to, you know, hold these people accountable still, like, because the work does continue. So it's a great starting point, but we can't allow that, the, the representation for the first, you know, um, half Black female vice president, right, and half South Asian to just be like, oh, well, everything's fine now. You know, we don't have to push back. We don't have to question. We don't have to challenge the things that she does or doesn't do. And it's the same thing with Joe Biden. It's not over just because we have somebody who, you know, is technically blue, right? I mean, it's a nice full soaker moment because, you know, Joe Biden, you know, has backed some things in the past that, you know, are completely different than now. But I think that, you know, people need to be ready to do the work. And like you said, you know, Jason, a lot of people do get their information from TikTok. And it's like, that's great, but that needs to be the starting point for you doing the research of people who've been doing these things, right? And to check those sources. Yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, I absolutely think it's significant. Um, you know, it does matter for um, individuals to be able to see themselves in certain positions, right? So we have this first for us. I can't tell you how many times I walk into the classroom and people sort of just stare. They're not sure what's happening. Like, is this the instructor? Uh, last semester, someone said, are you the substitute? Um, <laughs> as if I, I can't be the regular instructor. So they're just not sure, like, because they don't see many Dr. Hosley's walking into the classroom and it's not because there's not more of me that are qualified to be there. Um, that, is, that is not the reason. So I think it is significant and important that, that people are able to see now Kamala in that position um, so that you know this is something that is possible. Um, but like Natalie said, um, it, the work, uh, must continue and we have to hold them accountable. Also, we hear the words we hear coming out of the administration. We hear talks about equity and we hear talks about systemic racism. Uh, we hear, we've seen plans, but we want to see that operationalized, right? We want to see action because words in and of it, you know, that, you know, just words alone doesn't get in, doesn't get us anywhere, right? Um, we've been fighting this fight for a long time. So I am hopeful um, that uh, we will actually see them, uh, we will see some of this realized with Kamala and Biden as they have promised us they would do. Thank you both, thank you. Yeah, and you know, it's critical, right? For us to recognize the importance of visibility and, and how uh, historically 
symbolic that is, right? Um, uh, and, and there's no way that we can set that aside. You know, I'm in other spaces where um, community organizers uh, end up doing that, dismissing the fact that there's something historical about this woman. And I just disagree with that being a position. I think that we have to take it in for what it is, right? Appreciate the fact that it has taken a long time. And this is because of the way that this country was structured, right? It was systematically structured for this not to happen. You know what I'm saying? So you got to understand that. If it was systematically set up for this not to happen, this is the significance of uh, Kamala Harris being there, right? At the same time, you know, we have to um, understand that visibility, um, you know, of uh, people of color does not necessarily equate to the realities of folks of color in general, right? Uh, it was the same type of narrative that we received with the election of Barack Obama, this presumption that America has that dealt a uh, dead blow to racism, right? Uh, it was as if you were talking about racism after having a black man in the highest office in the nation, that uh, you were essentially um, uh, not uh, taking ownership or the responsibility of you not succeeding like Barack Obama, right? So be prepared. Those uh, racist troops are already out there and they're coming, right? Um, uh, Kamala Harris will be in an impossible situation because she has to perform at a um, um, in the in what is known as the masculinity contest of politics, right? And at the same time, she will always fall short in representing all Black Americans, all people of color, right, or all marginalized communities. So be real, right? Um, this one individual is to be celebrated in terms of our representation, and we are going to do our job collectively to make sure that the promises uh, that were made during the campaign are not forgotten. This is where our collective work comes in, right? We cannot suddenly presume that uh, voting was all that mattered, right? The actual grassroots work right here in your local, right here at Grossman College and Cuyamaca College. We gotta keep our own leaders accountable, right? All of these statements about anti-racism and doing what we want um, to um, fight uh, structural and systemic racism. All right, I love those statements. Now, show me. And the show me comes with our collective pressure. Policies, how does it look like? How are uh, programs funded or underfunded? Programs that actually serve our students, right? Where is the money, right? How is it being distributed? How is this actually equity, right? What are we talking about? What is this language, right? So I think it is important for us to remain um, um, optimistic because optimism over despair always, but at the same time, um, vigilant, right? Uh, not to let our guard down over the work that we have to collectively do. Um, I want to add to that. So, you know, I think I saw, I did see a sketch of um, Amanda Gorman. She was the inaugural poet carrying Uncle Sam. And so that kind of lends to what, you know, Halil was saying about like the caricaturization of the people who are now sort of being like, who are now in the spotlight, right? And this idea that in the case of Amanda Gorman and even of Stacey Abrams, that it's somehow black women's responsibility to carry anybody, right? Has, has already begun. This, this, this young woman was an inaugural poet, but they're already drawing her carrying Uncle Sam, which already leans into like what Hilo was saying about, you know, how Kamala Harris is gonna have to be, you know, the role she's gonna be playing as a woman in a man's political game, but also how black women are constantly, you know, in this case, like defeminized in a way to say that, you know, it's their job to carry um, anybody. So that just, I wanted to add to that because I just thought about that when he was talking. Absolutely love all of those points, you guys. Um, you know, you guys made me think of something as well, um, looking at our bullet point. The next one we are going to transition to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, when I looked at that movement, and let's just focus on the positive parts of that movement, the, the, the productive parts of that movement, not to where it may have turned ugly 
um, and some of the best and the leaders. I want I want to focus on the pure Black Lives Matter movement and those goals, uh, just because as we know, at, at any kind of protest, just like we saw at on. Six, you know, there's people who are the genuinely out there who want to protest, and then yes, there are negative elements who show up to that protest who get a little bit more unruly. But when we look at the beautifulness of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and aspects, there was a rainbow coalition of of people out there. I saw all shades out there, you know, especially after the George, George Floyd murders and some of the other tragic events. You know, just a rainbow coalition of people taken to the injustice and coming together. I guess the question would be, what significance of the Black Lives Matter movement and those protests, uh, what kind of significance did that have or those events have on the 2020 election and where we are now? I'll get it started if you all permit me. Uh, I'm going to push back a little, uh, Dr. Allen here, you know, because I believe that it's a false equivalent to presume that uh, the movement for Black Lives represented by Black Lives Matter can be in any way put at par with the white supremacist uh, uh, attempted coup that took place in, in January 6th. Let's make that uh, abundantly clear, right? That's a false equivalent. So I think it's important to do that, right? I also believe that in, in the question of um, the Black Lives Matter, the beauty of it, as if there's uh, some ugliness about it, I think also it's important to push back because what set in motion the Black Lives Matter movement is an ever-present and abundant um, state-sanctioned violence in the form of police brutality and police murders. Let's be very clear, right? George Floyd was murdered by a police, right? And like many other folks, say her name, Brianna Taylor and many others, right? It is critical for us to understand that, you know, uh, paraphrasing Martin Luther King here, um, uh, a riot is the, uh, uh, is the voice of the unheard, right? And it is very different, right? Black Lives Matter is protecting, processing an injustice. Existing as a black person is dangerous, right? Jogging as a black person is dangerous. Sleeping as a black person is dangerous. Bird watching as a black person is dangerous, right? Forget about it. You happen to have any mental health challenge as a black person and it is dangerous. I won't even touch on driving while black because it's almost like uh, a given, right? Walking while black, right? Think about all of the different ways in which we fear blackness because it has been the culture that we all breathe, right? So all of us have to first do a little bit of internal analysis of how, not if, how have we learned to uh, embrace anti-blackness in our everyday life? And we gotta do some unlearning, right? So I think it's important not to equate those, those movements. So coming back to the beauty of the Black Lives Matter movement, it's a shooting star, says Ibram uh, Kendi, that uh, it was uh, how he prefaced his book, Stamp from the Beginning, um, The History of uh, Racist Ideas in America, highly recommended book. And uh, the Black Lives Matter movement starts with, you know, uh, looking at what happened in Florida with vigilantes are able to take the life of a young boy in Trayvon Martin, right? Uh, again, this notion of um, social policies that perpetuate anti-Blackness, right? And this is essentially what stands your ground, stand your ground policy in Florida is, right? Uh, and I think it's central for us to uh, also point out that it's a Black women and queer Black women movement as central in the leadership. So we have to recognize also what we can learn, you know, from our, um, um, our queer community, right? Particularly our, our uh, feminist black women in our queer community that are teaching us how to do this. And I, let me just say before I, 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 I pass it on, get your hands in anything that Kianga Jamara Taylor is writing but one book that I highly recommend that I hope is highlighted later is uh, for, uh, From Black Lives Matters to 
Black Liberation. I highly recommend that in this topic. You know, I want to add that, you know, there's, I don't know the little girl's name, but you know, there's been a nine year old girl who has been, um, she was already handcuffed and was pepper sprayed in the face, right, by police. So also that, you know, even all the things that Julio mentioned, even being a child, like black people, black children are not seen as kids. And a lot of this, since, you know, the beginning, I went over the historical stuff, all of this has roots in the past. And these are things that have still been perpetuated in many communities even today, right? Because of course, stand your ground as a black woman does not give you the same protections, right? I mean, there's been black women who have been taken to jail for shooting through the roof when someone was trying to come into their home or was a domestic violence threat, right? So these laws, looking at how these laws are written and who they do and don't protect is very important. Um, and that's part of the analysis, right? Of not just thinking that, you know, the stand your ground law is just applicable to everybody. Like people have different experiences with those legislation, legislative rules. Yeah, and I just wanna add that, um, you know, in terms of Black Lives Matter um, and one of the things I heard um, when some of the, you know, rioting or destruction was happening was, people really being upset and bothered by buildings being destroyed or windows being busted or whatever, destruction of property. But I have to tell you that um, it's frustrating as a black person and as a black woman to hear people so concerned about property, but silent when black people are killed silent when the Atatiana Jeffersons and the Michael Browns and the Trayvon Martins and so on and so on, we know the names. There's silence when that happens, but concern over property. So we just have to, to, the, to those of you who have joined us today to think about that um, and why that is and what that says, right? Um, there has to be a process of unlearning. I think Julio uh, talked about it earlier. We have a lot of junk, you know, for lack of a better way of, <laughs> of saying it. You've taken in a lot of junk, a lot of misinformation, a lot of lies, a lot uh, about other people. And you have to be willing to unlearn that so that you can see clearly. Think about what your prescription is, what went into your prescription and what, what are you seeing? Um, and, and what would cause someone to, to be so concerned about property and less about people? Um, I, I think the, the Black Lives Matter movement and you know, social movements throughout history, this is, this is how we have, one of the ways that we have pushed for change, right? And that will, that will absolutely continue. So I do think it's significant. Um, and it, you know, uh, like I said, it will, it will continue. We have to continue to do that work. Yeah. And, you know, and just going up that too, understanding that when, when black people do advocate, it helps everybody else. And this is something that has gone on even after post reconstruction, right? The reconstruction amendments that were aimed at reincorporating or incorporating former slaves into the country benefited other groups of people immediately because of that. So, right, so for people to act like it's removed, that they don't have any place in it, that they don't benefit from it is ridiculous because historically and presently, they absolutely do. And you, Natalie made me think of something. Um, Jason, you, I think you mentioned it about the sort of coalition of people that were at these Black Lives Matter marches, right? In the past where we may have seen primarily um, Black faces, there were people from all different backgrounds um, at these protests. And, um, you know, several of the, the individuals who lost their lives um, at one of the protests uh, were white. Um, this is not our fight. Um, white people and people from other backgrounds, um, this is all of our work to, our work to do. Um, I was happy to see a change. I was happy to see 
people come out and finally say, wow, this is enough. You know, George Floyd was an awakening. I'm not sure. Um, I'll just say that it was, it was an awakening for people. And maybe it was because we were home and everyone was watching. Um, and that's what was different. Um, but it, it's for, it's, this is work for all of us. It is, it is not to rest uh, on, the, on the backs of black people or folks of color. We didn't create the situation. We didn't ask for it. Uh, and we all need to be involved in correcting it. Yeah. And, you know, historically thinking about Armad Arbery, you know, I think that one, like you said, Tyson, you know, people were home, so they saw, like with George Floyd, right? But with Armad Arbery, they, they recorded them chasing him down in a truck. And so for a lot of people, that visual of people being in a truck, running somebody down and then killing them yeah. was a direct connection to 40, 50 years ago. Right. So it looked very much like we can't just excuse this. Like this is something that we've seen, that, that a scene that we're familiar with. So we can automatically peg it as something that is racially motivated. So you're absolutely right. Like people being home, I think, is a large part of this. And people considering the situations in which these people are being murdered and the scenarios that are happening and then the attempt to justify it at the end. 1,000%, you guys, and 8,000% <clears throat> feeling with everything that was just said. And so, you know, in keeping with the overarching theme, uh, it was mentioned earlier by uh, Professor Soto, um, the work isn't over. So yes, the, the, the 2020 election was amazing um, as far as what was accomplished and the fact that we historically had a historic moment where the nation's first uh, woman and uh, woman of color was elected to the vice presidency. But again, the work isn't over. So approaching our last bullet point here, and then we'll open it up, uh, we'll, we'll read some of the questions in the comment section. Uh, we have a couple of student questions that are really good. Um, the last bullet point. So there is still work to be done. And so can we kind of maybe try to do our best to paint a picture of what that work might look like for our young people moving forward? How do they carry the torch now? How are we training them how are they training themselves uh, in their, their educations and in their professional endeavors to continue the work that needs to be done? What does that work even look like? Where do we go from here? Well, one of the things um, is that we need to change that the mindset that my one vote doesn't matter in this process. Um, with Trump being elected, he was able to appoint three Supreme Court justices. We are living with, my children are living with, your children are living with. He also was able to appoint over 50 federal appellate judges in four oh, years. Yeah. Obama appointed 55 in eight years, right? So this is, a, a significant number. And these federal judges are the ones who have the final word on many legal appeals across the country. So if you think it doesn't matter, think again in terms of what that can mean for us in a system that is already working against us. Before Trump came into the position, before we got three more conservative justices, before the 54 uh, appellate judges, judges um, this is, it matters big time. <laughs> and so for people that are wondering, you know, well, what can I do? When you hear someone saying, well, I'm just not voting. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not gonna sit this one out, right? you can have a conversation with that individual and talk about actually how important it is to be a part of the process um, because there are long-term impacts. Don't leave it to someone else, right? Don't leave your destiny um, or your children's or so forth to someone else. So it's important to be a part of the process. And Natalie talked about him, um, Natalie, I'll, I'll just turn it over, but you talked about locally as well. Um, how important it is. Yeah, um, I always encourage, I mean, this last election, I did a lot on my Instagram. Um, some of you is at Natalie History. And I talked a lot about why propositions are important. And, you know, 
it's not just about voting for the individual people and just, you know, piggyback from what Tysi said, you know, you vote in the elections for people who are going to be judges, like the local representatives for who's the DA. Like some of you watch SVU and Law and Order. So you know, these people are the structural gatekeepers of the prison industrial complex, which disproportionately affects black and brown people. So, you know, when you say something as simple as, well, my vote doesn't count, it's like, yes, it does. Because these people stay in power, like Tysi said, you know, for, for, for potentially one to two generations. So it's hugely important to look at, you know, and voting where your money is going, how the city budgets things, who they're giving resources to, um, you know, how that affects the school, who's on, I'm sorry, I'm like getting upset, right? But who's on, you know, the educational boards for the colleges, for the K through 12, like all this stuff is very, very important. So reading those books, going to official government websites to read about what the vote yes and no means, Please, I always say this, do not rely on commercials because people pay to have that. And some of you see what's happening with Prop 22 and the ride shares. And, you know, it's, it goes beyond just what, you know, what the people who are paying to have you vote a specific way want you to know about. So not only getting involved in knowing what's going on you know, in your local area, but, um, you know, I would, as a, you know, an instructor, I would say take classes of perspective that you don't personally identify with. Right, like take, you know, if, you, if you're not black, take the black perspectives class. If you're not native, take a native history class. If you're not Latinx, right? Cause I mean, you can be Latinx and be other races cause Latinx is not a race, but take different perspectives to learn about where these people are coming from and to know why they're still upset about what they're dealing with today. Let me stop because I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yes, yes, thank you all, yes. So um, this is my favorite part because this is where I get to talk directly to students. So I'm gonna focus on students. Even though we may have some faculty, I hope we have some administrators there listening too because you all got some learning to do as well, you know? But directly for my beautiful students, beautiful students in my classes and the classes of other professors that kindly have invited you here. Beautiful students from Helix High School, right? Taking some courses while you're in high school. So you can learn, learn about culture. It's amazing that you're here. I think that don't overwhelm yourself, right? The act of educating yourself is revolutionary enough, right? You gotta think about that, right? In the middle of a pandemic that has exacerbated all kinds of inequalities. If you were broke before the pandemic, you are extra broke in the pandemic, right? And yet, you're showing up. So give yourself a good hug. Be kind to yourself because you're already doing something by showing up to your classes. The system keeps telling you you don't belong and yet you show up, especially folks of color, especially working class folks, right? So be kind to yourself and start where you are, but don't stop there. That's actually the title of a book by Richard Milner. Start where you are, but don't stop there. You bring wealth of knowledge already. Your lived experiences already season you in a lot of what we're talking about. What you're doing now in your academic endeavor is that you are learning vocabulary, theoretical frameworks, so you can have a, a full analysis of the situation, not just informed by, you know, in the real social media is nothing but, you know, an ideological bubble, right? You gotta be very mindful, right? Uh, I'll let you, I'll tell you about some documentaries, but there's one called Digital Disconnect that takes a look at how media essentially is, uh, in social media in particular, is uh, designed with algorithms to tell you what you want to hear, and you gotta challenge that, right? And this goes for whites and non-white folks, right? You gotta challenge that, but be kind to yourself because by being here, by being in your schooling process you're already doing work. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not involved in activism if you are doing some schooling, right? So now it's a matter of gaining an education. Let's go through the schooling process, but let's gain an education. So like Professor Natalie uh, just told us, uh, yeah, ethnic studies now and forever, right? Find yourself some ethnic studies courses, you know, look at people's history of the United States by how we're saying to get you started. Look at settler colonialism, right? Think about what it means to be a society built on 
colonies, right? With structures and systems that gradually transfer into our nation and continue to plague the inequities of our society today. And don't get me started about books because back here, these are not just props. I did right? Come into classes, open to learning, be teachable, right? Challenge yourself, be self-reflective, right? Uh, it's only when we take a step back and reflect on our preconceived notions that this unlearning takes place. So I think you got this. Uh, the only reason why I continue to have some hope is because you're here, because you keep impressing me every single time uh, with ways that you are transforming yourself. And I'm like, oh, yes, you know, tomorrow will be better, right? So there's a lot that you're already doing that I believe you just got to pick up from there and then push yourself, community organizing, plug yourself in some of these uh, um, student government spaces where you can influence the larger needs of you as a student community. You got a voice, push that voice, keep us accountable. Faculty, classified staff, administrators, keep us accountable. Say, you promise to dismantle racism? What's up? Show me, tell us. You know what I'm saying? I love you. Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, we have reached the conclusion of our talking points and we still have a few minutes left. I wanted to get to a couple of these students' questions in the comment section. One actually ties directly into your last message, uh, Professor Soto, uh, that I wanted to address first and foremost. Um, and for the other students who who posted questions a little bit earlier than the question I'm getting ready to read, please do not worry. We're gonna record everything and uh, I will email each one of our panelists uh, a list of these questions. And who knows, maybe you will get a personal email uh, from each one of them answering your question um, with uh, some attached literature too, to, to help you along your way. Um, but what I mentioned, uh, and actually everyone mentioned how this type of work can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, it can be a, a lot just because when you're tackling the forces here that we're talking about, you have to remember that the roots run deep. They're long. We're talking about generations of negative uh, uh, forces that you may be fighting against. So this question from Holly Elam. As a white woman um, that got cut off from her family uh, this year due to racism and her addressing that racism, uh, she feels isolated and alone. I'm sure there's others like me. How can we make connections? Um, so she's asking who she can connect with. Uh, many of us already reached out like FYE and the Moja program and other students, uh, student centered programs on campus. We're offering those supports. But my question would be, you know, as you start to do this work, there will be those in your circles who will kick back or will won't go with you. Hey, what's going on? Or nah, I can't go down that road with you. Uh, even though you know that this justice work is right. To my panel of professors, do you have any advice to Holly and students or, or people who may be in similar situations to where when you start to question what you're seeing going on, when you start to, to ask those questions and try to address them, what should you do when your circle starts to turn on you? Um, I mean, I know that we're not on campus right now, but what I would suggest is, you know, reaching out to people and students who are in these other groups, right? Um, but, you know, building a new circle, right? I mean, there are many people who do feel isolated, right? Because even though I don't feel isolated from my family as a result of, you know, these things, I do feel isolated as a community member at times because of the things that happen, right? So um, I would say, yeah, definitely getting involved with different student organizations, um, you know, hope when we do get back to campus, right, um, going to these events, like meeting new people, I think is largely beneficial for helping build a new social network so that you don't feel so isolated, especially, and that you feel, um, you know, supported in the decisions that you're making. Because isolation, I, I wouldn't want anyone to feel like their isolation means that those people are right, right, that, that you shouldn't be doing the work that you're doing, because you absolutely should. And I just, I just. Oh, sorry, you're muted, Tyson. 
didn't catch that. I just wanted to echo what Natalie said in terms of creating a new circle. Um, family doesn't have to be blood. Um, in my family, we joke because we've taken so many people in and we, we call them family. We treat them like family. To us, there's no different. Um, there's no difference. Um, we will, you know, support you and be there for you. So create, find those people who are supportive of you. Um, it's critical. Um, you can't focus on school or anything else without a support network. And, and that doesn't have to come from family if family has turned away. Um, there are uh, people out there for sure who will open up and embrace you. Um, I'll say that it won't necessarily be easy. Um, hard work, progress, uh, it's it, it, things that are, um, what's the saying? Now I'm losing the saying. <laughs> things, in work, things in life worth having are often difficult, right? So it won't necessarily be easy, easy this journey that you've started, but I think it's worth it. So just continue on that path and find um, a support uh, network for yourself. Let me throw in, um, and this is Holly, right? Holly is the name of the person that. So Holly, uh, I'm gonna assume that you asking this question, you're open to our answers, right? So, so here it goes, okay? Because I'm gonna challenge you. Uh, I love it, you know, that my colleagues here I did what you know us folks of color are so used to doing too, uh, which is taking care of you, my uh, white people, right? Um, with you know the struggles that you're talking about uh, in uh, being challenged and being ostracized by family members because you challenge them about racism. Uh, that's a good step, you know. That's an important step, but that discomfort. It's part of the process. So it is so important that you stay with that discomfort and turn the lens on you, right? Look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, why am I uncomfortable? Because I argue that part of this discomfort comes with the fact that perhaps they're not, there has not been a critical interrogation of your whiteness as an identity, right? And that's important. In this struggle for racial justice, white folks have to do a lot of that work. All of us have to do that work. But when you are part of the dominant group, it is more likely than not that you have not spent critical time actually asking yourself, what does it mean to be white, right? Most recently, you have probably heard the term white fragility. And I love the work of sociologist Robin DiAngelo uh, I argue that her actual academic work before this book that was popularized in 2018 is much more important because she breaks down these common responses that white folks have when conversations about racism and being challenged to discuss and interrogate their whiteness, um, what those moves that are most common uh, we made. So here we are in, in the issue is, uh, we're talking about Black Vote and the amazing celebration, but it's important that we don't center whiteness, right? Some of the work, Holly, has to be done by you. Now, we love you. We love you just the same. In fact, nothing's gonna happen without the critical mass of white people getting on board, right? It's gonna be a reality that you all gonna have to get on board, right? So how do we reconcile between those contradictions? Do a little bit of work. Towards the end of this session, I'm gonna share some starting points that you may wanna look into. I hope that you are comfortable with being uncomfortable, with being challenged to spend a little bit of time on your own, investigating your own whiteness, and then plug yourself in spaces. There's a need for a space for white people to talk to other white people about this. And there's a time when you may gravitate into spaces of people of color without monopolizing that space so that you know when to step back, when to listen and learn, and when it's time for you to use your privilege in the platforms that you have to challenge others, particularly other white folks, to wrestle with the unrecognized racism that sometimes plays a role in their discourse. 
you know, this reminded me of uh, uh, Jane Elliott and a lot of the work that she does um, talking about and getting white people to understand at least just a, just like a crumb of what it feels like to be discriminated against for no reason. So I would definitely recommend checking out some of her things on YouTube. Um, and she, you know, she really calls her own people because she's a white woman to sit in that discomfort and, you know, don't just walk out of the room because you have the privilege to do so, or, you know, get so caught up in your own feelings about this, that you stop doing the work and stop wanting to understand because your feelings are hurt. So that made me think about that. I would totally recommend you all check that out. It's a free resource, right, on YouTube. Yeah. Love that, love that. Thank you guys so much. And uh, in the uh, efforts of time, this uh, program ends at four. What we're going to do, um, there's still so many great questions, including math uh, chair Steve Davis's question. Um, Basically, when we're talking about the work that still has to be done, you, you guys don't have to wait till you graduate. You don't have to wait till you have your, your degree and you're out in the workplace. For those of you who have the time in your schedules, you know, we have officer elections on campus where you can run to be a student government governor or a student government member. Um, and yes, faculty and administrators, they listen to your voice and we need more representation in those positions, whether you're talking about the ASGC president, vice president, treasurer, you know, just like in high school when you had the, the student bodies, except this, we really want to hear what students need. We want to hear your voices. And so we do need a diverse representation of students from all walks of life to participate in these efforts. Um, I promised you guys a literature list and a podcast list. Um, I'm talking to our uh, site supervisor, our technology specialist, Lorena uh, Ruggiero, and we're going to post all that information along with this is going to be recorded on the YouTube live Grossmont channel. Uh, you will be able to go through uh, the podcast list as well as an extensive book list where all this information that these professors are presenting comes from. So hopefully you guys don't just end it here. You go and pick up some of these books. I, you know, I asked Julio uh, last year and he responded with an amazing list for myself on Amazon. I went and picked up all these books. Um, if you think I'm lying, I am not. <laughs> I have them right here sitting next to me on my desk. Uh, thank you, Julio, for those. I'm still getting through those. But I challenge all the students to do that as well. Also, hit the like button on your, your, your YouTube live channel, hit the subscribe because we have three more amazing events just like this coming for the rest of the month of February, where we will be celebrating black, black people, African-American people, black culture and its impact on society and the world. So we hope that you guys join us. Our very next event will be February 10th. We have an amazing guest speaker from San Diego State coming in to talk about uh, anti-Blackness and how to move to a place of healing. That will be February 10th, which is a Wednesday at three o'clock on this same here channel. And thank you guys, really, really thank you guys for coming, uh, taking some time out to do some personal growth and celebrate the kickoff of Black History Month with us. Thanks everybody. <laughs> thank you. We're gonna go ahead and stop broadcasting now. Um, we will still be, we'll still hang out uh, afterwards if, uh, if the professors still wanna talk and, and uh, do some things like that. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming and thank you to our faculty uh, for encouraging their students to come as well. Um, thank you guys. Thank you. Have a good semester. Yeah.